Election hacks are increasingly normal, but are they a threat to our democratic ideals or perhaps a step towards a more democratic system? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. Hackers are getting bigger and bolder. Last month, the ransomware Petya brought down companies in 64 countries, including banks, law firms and an energy giant. But what happens when an online invasion threatens democracy? Both the 2016 US election and this year's French presidential election saw significant hacks. Emails were leaked in an attempt to damage the two candidates' campaigns and some say undermine democratic ideals, perhaps change. The course of history. It's existed for millennia and formed a pillar of Western society, shaping the world in which we live to become a foundation of modern political virtue. Democracy. 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 It means power to the people. Democracy is held up by many as a bastion of law and order. But is that pillar now under threat? Whether it's fake news, misinformation, or hacking and leaking, this is manipulation at the basic nucleus of how your government and your country works. As hacks and leaks become a feature of the modern election, are they undermining modern day democracy? and can they be stopped? Hacks have of late become a feature of Western elections. Hillary Clinton saw her campaign hacked, as did Emmanuel Macron in France. Their team's communications then posted online. Time to do maximum damage to both candidates. U.S. intelligence accused Vladimir Putin of ordering the Clinton hack. Its objective to seemingly hurt her campaign and tilt the election in favor of Donald Trump. He certainly interfered in our election, and it was clear he interfered to hurt me and to help my opponent. Macron's team also pointed fingers at Russian hackers, allegations the Kremlin deny. But hacking isn't a new concept. Groups like Anonymous say it holds the powerful to account. There are now questions on whether leaks are hurting the democratic process. If a democracy is based on the idea that more information makes popular opinion better informed and that we get better decisions, if you manipulate that popular opinion, it, it changes the system, it changes the, the basic calculation of the system. And with the speed of the internet and fault lines in cybersecurity, the effect of hacks can be far-reaching. And keeping information out of the public eye is increasingly difficult. Some see leaks as a vital part of free and open societies, giving people the power to expose corruption and cover-ups like never before. But now there are questions about the harm they can do to the democratic process. Or will election hacks simply be the new normal, a feature of 21st century democracy? So are election hacks a threat to our democratic values or is this simply 21st century transparency, openness, the key cornerstones of democracy? Well, joining me at today's round table from Berlin, Rick Falk Vinge, he founded the Pirate Party, which was built around reforming copyright law and now campaigns for freedom of information and internet neutrality. Also at the table, Nigel Inkster, Director of Cybersecurity at IISS, a former Operations Director at British Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. And to my left, we have Mustafa al a former Black Hat hacker, member of LUSEC, a group that hacked the FBI, for which he was convicted, now completing a PhD at University College London. Making up the panel, we have Dr. Athena Karatsogiani, written extensively about the rise and spread of hacktivism and cyber conflict. Welcome 
to you all. Uh, Rick in Berlin, let me go to you first of all. You've said that hacking hardens and strengthens democracy, but it, in a sense, also subverts it. Well, it doesn't subvert the old guard who are used to being able to control the narrative. We've had a self-selected elite able to publish newspapers, able to publish stories, able to essentially control what the public knows. This is a, a lot in parallel with when the printing press arrived and the people in power at that point actually tried to ban the printing press and did so up to and including the death penalty because but what would, what would give you the right or somebody else in your position the right to put this out there in the public domain where do you become kingmaker in all this well assuming that democracy is a common evaluation of all the ideas on the table then it shouldn't matter where those ideas come from it's a different thing if you're hacking democracy and hacking the actual election like when 4chan hacked the Taylor Swift popularity contest, where Taylor Swift held a contest of what school she should be performing at. 4chan hacked this vote and made a school for deaf students win, so Taylor Swift would go play there. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about bringing more information to the table and not hacking the vote as such, and that's, cru that's a crucial distinction. Yeah, Rick, N Nigel Ingster, as a former spy master, I mean, we, we need secrets, don't we? Uh, well, I think there are all sorts of areas of life uh, where secrecy you know, is actually essential. I mean, things like lawyer-client privilege, doctor-patient confidentiality, um, that kind of thing you know, is, is essential. Um, that said, I, I think there is a case you know, for, for making as much uh, information available as possible and not allowing it to be monopolized. But I would just offer one word of caution, which is that information doesn't necessarily equal understanding. Information that is released uh, into the public domain without any kind of context, without any kind of background, can be dangerous, dangerously misleading. And dangerous in itself, perhaps. Potentially so, yes. Yeah, what do you want to say, Athena? Um, I think uh, uh, this is uh, correct. Uh, however, w what we see is a, a professionalization of lectivism. I mean, if you look at uh, the Panama Papers, you had uh, hundreds of people working uh, on that uh, with very professionalized manner, how the Snowden leaks uh, were handled by the various uh, publishers where in the media industry was transformed the industry. So actually, uh, the leaks are not just out there for people to just <laughs> make up uh, uh, as a go along what they mean. This is a, a journalist investigatory, uh, investigative journalism that has professionalized this field to, to an extent that we do understand what this leaks means. But and we're all assuming, aren't we, to some extent, that the hackers, they know what they're doing, and the <coughs> journalists who are fed information which could be selective mm. also know what they're doing when they're putting it in a, in a context. You, you've opened Pandora's box here, Mustafa, you and others, and you were found guilty of, of doing so. In any sense, you regret what happened, what it led to? Well, I think a lot of positive things came out of what we did. Um, and it was a real, um, case that, a, a real good case study for me, I think, to show that um, hacktivism could have a positive impact on the world. So, for example, okay, well, well, yeah, give us an so, example. So, for example, in 2011, when we hacked um, HB Gary, which is a federal contractor to the, Depart to the Department of Defense, um, the, the leaks that we exposed to show that um, they were planning to do things like blackmail American journalists, that actually ended up in an in, in investigation in Congress. So that these things do actually inform not just the public, but politicians to make informed decisions but, about but society. Would you feel at all embarrassed about accessing really sensitive material that could be a danger to national security? Well... Because presumably you could. Well, yes, you could, but it's all about, you have to think about um, sometimes things that are made secret, sometimes those things should be public because they are in public interest. Is that for somebody like Mustafa to decide, though, Nigel? Well, that, I think that's a very interesting question, isn't it? Because we elect governments uh, to run our affairs and we kind of subcontract to them um, some of these issues and some of these decisions. And if we don't like those decisions, then the whole point about democracy is we, we, you know, we, we throw the bums out and elect a new lot of bums. Um, so, um, it you know, seems they can't protect their own infrastructures on their own grids because yeah. you have mm -hmm. leaks happening all the but time. Be because so. somebody <laughs> is vulnerable, does that mean you should attack them? It is a, a government that is supposed to take care of information um, and have a robust cybersecurity systems. If they cannot uh, protect mm. their own intranets and what they're doing, I mean, where are we? This is the problem. It's like uh, if you try to uh, cut sand, it's going to flow through your 
your fingers. So actually having policy that makes decisions and, and documents available to the public in terms of uh, robust digital governance. And let, me, let, me get, yeah. let me go to Rick, if I may. Um, mm. In a sense, by doing this, you become judge, jury and executioner, potentially at least. You do, but I think it's important here to not stare yourself blind at this is happening over the internet and look at the bigger picture. We've been celebrating heroes who have leaked documents for decades. Look at the famous Deep Throat who has exposed wrongdoings du during uh, American administrations. Look at the activists who broke into the FBI office by taping a small note to the door saying, please don't lock this door tonight, and expose the Co-Intel Pro program, which was infiltrating activism. This is essentially what is happening with today's activism and today's leaks, only for some reason, we, it used to be that an activist was handing a binder of papers to a journalist and it was completely legal and it was protected by law. Journalists had a right, if not even an obligation in some countries, to protect but, their But sources. you talked about how now things this has are been being made skewed, illegal Rick. just because it's digital? Why, yeah, why do we do that? You did, you, in, in your first answer, you talked about how things are being skewed. You, you mentioned Taylor Swift, but if, if you skew an election, uh, what kind of responsibility do you have for changing the course of history, perhaps in a wrong way? In, in the case of the DNC leaks, let's, I mean, these are things that happened. And if this had been in the analog world and somebody had published memos or leaked memos, we would not bat an eyelid. Now, just because some, it was published digitally and somebody hinted who the source may be, then it's supposed to be challenging the election result. That's not how we did it in the past. That's not how we did it in the analog world. And there's no reason to do it any different in the digital world. If it's true and reporters deem it in the public interest and publish it, we should not be concerned with who the source mm. was. In fact, we should protect the source. Well, should they go after the source, Nigel? I mean, as, as a, a former man in well, I mean, the, reality, the top of MI6, that was your job, wasn't it? Um, well, the reality was we, uh, my, my job was actually to steal other people's secrets. So uh, I look at this uh, from the perspective of poacher turned gamekeeper. But in the case of the Democratic National uh, Committee election, I mean, I, have, I, I, don't, I don't think you can just eliminate you know, the motive factor. I mean, we, we know, I mean, let's not you know, mince words. This was done by Russian intelligence um, to cause confusion, cause uncertainty, call into question the legitimacy of the process, attempt to establish a false equivalence between the way Russia uh, under Vladimir Putin steals elections and rigs the system, uh, and American system where it happens to some extent. I mean, you know, states have uh, enacted legislation, the purpose of which is clearly to make it as hard as possible for blacks and ethnic minorities to vote. But, you know, the, the, there really is no comparison between a U.S. election and, uh, and a Russian election. But this is the danger, Mustafa, isn't it? I mean, you, you steal this information, you put it out there, you're effectively um, handing an arsonist a can of petrol and a box of matches. What look, they do with it, um, you might say, is not your responsibility, but it could be catastrophic. I, I mean, look, in a world where everyone's complaining about fake news and alternative facts, we have a situation where you, someone is handing to you on a plate real facts. How do you know real that? Facts. How do you know they're real? Well, there's lots of ways to verify that. For example, the digital signatures in the emails, and you can also collaborate, corroborate also the evidence. Yeah, I'm not saying take it, take it with a pinch. I'm not saying take it um, immediately, but obviously verify it. But someone is handing you on a plate actual um, documents and facts. So we should not be complaining about that, and we should be looking at that to, to, get, to get facts. If but I if may you, yes, uh, intervene, uh, we have seen with the doping leaks uh, that you can actually mendle sometimes with the documents that are leaked. So it is not a fail-safe oh, because, yeah. because uh, they were leaked. But uh, what I was going to say about the DNC leaks, um, that I think there is an exaggeration about the impact that they had because, I mean, the fact was Hillary Clinton ran a, uh, not a very good campaign. And the, in, in all uh, leagues and, and scenarios like this, structural factors are very important. So you might say, oh, the Arab Spring, uh, you know, whether it was a spring is questionable. But you have a scenario that, uh, oh, social media, the social media revolution, WikiLeaks revolution, all that kind of stuff. But there are structural factors such as you know, liberal adjustment programs, Poverty, inequality, you know, all sorts of corrupt regimes and so on. So may, may it, is, I, it cannot be the internet is, is responsible for influencing this and the other all the time. There are structural, real May, uh, may I go back conditions. to the idea of hacking elections, mm -hmm. which was the premise on which we, we started 
this program. Can you end up with a stronger democracy because of hacking, or is it always going to therefore be liable to being pulled down at the first sign of weakness? Well, I think that's a very good question. If you look at the American election, uh, I agree with everything Athena said. You know, Hillary was a weak candidate, and it's not at all evident that the Russian interference actually shaped the outcome of that uh, uh, election. I think James Comey's belated inf intervention reactivating the whole Hillary Clinton email saga was probably much more influential in terms of the outcome than anything Russia tried to do. Same with France. You know, look at uh, Macron. Uh, you know, he, he's emerged uh, strengthened and fortified uh, by, by what he's gone through. And the threat from uh, Russian intelligence in, in these cases, I would argue, has been diminished uh, simply through awareness that this is happening. People understand what's going on now. You know, they are um, better prepared to deal with it and uh, more um, able to um, aim off. We, we, we'll come to how this could or can be possibly prevented in the future in just a moment. But, Rick, I, I want to talk to you. I mean, one of, one of your signatures is putting on a fake pirate's eye, I know, because you're with the pirate organization, but it brings to mind Blofeld, the James mm. Bond oh. villain, which brings to mind Nigel Inkster sitting next to me, not the villain, but the person <laughs> trying, trying to catch him. And, and I wonder if you think that there could be somebody who could take incredible advantage of this in, in the most corrupt and, and dangerous way. And you and the people who've let this cat out of the bag wouldn't be able to control it. I would say that uh, I would say it's the exact other way around. As in, the, the, we have a self-selected elite who have been not corrupt as such, but who have been able to control the narrative, able to control newspapers, able to control, to control the information flow. But as it turns out, public interest is very, very self-regulating. If, as Mustafa says, if we have a leaked fact, and that fact can be corroborated by some trustworthy mechanism, and that is in the public interest, then today it will spread all by itself. Mainstream media is no longer required to inform the public. Yeah. And that's the big difference here. I suppose, I suppose one of the points I was trying to, trying to get at was um, if you are extremely clever, you could manipulate digital signatures, you could change something so that it looked like it was real, you, you, you could you, you malignly could not, well, you influence. You could not manipulate digital signatures. What you can do, though, is manipulate public opinion. And unfortunately, that has been very easy. It is much harder today, I would argue, because yeah. people can go to, the, go to the source and check facts for themselves. And so a story becomes falsified much, much quicker today than, it ever, than it's ever been. Okay, but stuff two sides. Rick, thank you. Um, should it be changed? Can we change it, this process? Or are we always going to have to get, as Athena said, just, just smarter uh, to, to avoid being caught what? out? Change the process of what, specifically? Well, the fact that systems can be hacked, the, the idea that it is a good thing. Yeah. I mean, you, what do you think about hacking elections, per se? Um, well, hacking elections themselves is obviously so, is not something... Uh, it's, it's a massive threat to democracy. Hacking... Um, information that would help to inform the public opinion is something completely different. Now, as for the topic of hacking elections, there's been a lot of research done into um, electronic voting machines and voting systems, etc. And um, specifically in the US, we've had a lot of research done into the electronic voting machines used in certain states and that have been shown to be vulnerable to certain security vulnerabilities. And The Intercept recently leaked a document from the NSA that showed that the Russians were actually hacking into an election, uh, a company that made the election machines, voting machines for the state. Well, I mean, so, what I'm asking is, is yeah. can this sort of thing be prevented? Um, well, it's very difficult because uh, over the past decade or two, there's been a lot of research done into electronic voting, and the consensus right now is, is electronic voting is a bad idea. Mm. So right now, we, we still have to do. Right now, we should still be using paper, paper voting. People talk about the ballot boxes, can't you? People talk about the blockchain as yeah. a solution, and uh, I believe you researched this. So, I mean, uh, help me with that. We're, we're distributed ledger technology. So, uh, where users, I mean, uh, I, I, I think Rick uh, would uh, be a great person to talk about that because people talk about blockchain as the new internet in the sense that it's the technology where Bitcoin is based on, so it relies on a peer network to verify. 
So you can do smart uh, contracts without having central uh, central uh, institutions like banks and so on. Banks are now trying it uh, manically, uh, the, the blockchain as a technology. Uh, so I think perhaps the blockchain could um, uh, uh, guarantee more privacy uh, for, the po for the population uh, in terms of how digital identity uh, is handled, uh, that you have elements of it uh, rather than uh, full identity. So, I mean, the United Nations, for example, uh, was looking at mm. having digital identity by 2030 uh, for marginalized populations, refugees. Do you still have to be a, a genius, as a lot of people around this table are, when it comes to this sort of thing, to do this? or? Well, I think it's filtered out of Nigel. I think there are two things. One, you know, firstly, there is Mustafa's point earlier about the scalability of this technology. You know, can you actually you know, uh, bring it out to you know, the the size that would be required? Secondly, whatever uh, form of technology is applied to this problem, we are going to get the inevitable action-reaction dynamic. So somebody somewhere is going to devote a lot of time and effort to subverting this technology um, and the chances are that sooner or later they will find a way to do it. And it will then be replaced by something else. Indeed. Rick? Can you hack democracy? Going, going full circle here. I think you can hack the old system and that's exactly what we're doing. The internet has produced a generation of people who communicate faster, better and more efficiently than any generation before them. The blockchain allows for a distributed ledger that removes the need for centralized trust, which is an enormous blow to everybody who has been profiting off of being the trust providers in terms of power, in terms of profit, in terms of corporate. And so, yes, technology is hacking democracy and it's marvelous and we're seeing so much good come out of it, but the people who are losing power they are going to be dragged into the future kicking and screaming. And it's going to be a real painful transition. If, but at the end of it, I we're going to see yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if uh, you don't look at the blockchain, uh, I think there is an upset. I mean, currently, uh, you had uh, main tabloids, uh, you know, were really um, campaign against Corbyn, and you had the result for the recent UK elections that showed that the top tabloid power in, in, uh, in, the, Uni in the United Kingdom is uh, mm. is uh, you know decreasing mm. because you have social media, you have a lot of uh, grassroots. Um, they are going and supported Corbyn, creating uh, games mm. like Corbyn Face or you know uh, Corbyn <laughs> Run, that kind of stuff. And you can see this popular uh, grassroots activism online using uh, to support this candidate. I think it had uh, a certain effect. I'm just going to put an idea. That, again, mm. there, there may, there did run a I want to put an idea out there. Uh, the, two of the most high-profile hacking figures in the world, Edward Snowden, mm -hmm. Julian Assange, uh, both uh, wanted, well certainly with Julian Assange, uh, believes that he was going to get taken to prison in the United States with an extradition, Edward Snowden in Russia at the moment, we don't know what's going to happen to him. Are these people going to be seen in future as knights in shining armour, as the heroes of democracy and force a complete rethink of where governments and authorities stand at the moment? Rick, you're nodding. Consider Donny Rumsfeld, who leaked the uh, who leaked the Pentagon Papers. He was being vilified at the time, and he was being hunted. It was a practical manhunt for this person who had led, who had leaked top secret papers about the Vietnam War. Today, he's seen as a hero. It, there's not even a stain on his record because he exposed facts. And I believe history will tell the same tale about our time. Nigel, the, the, the times there are changing? Um, um, I wonder about that. I and mean, if you look at what uh, Assange uh, put out in WikiLeaks, a lot of the stuff, for example, you know, from the US State Department, to my mind, all it showed was you know, a very competent organization doing its job rather well. And I don't see that there's you know, anything wrong with that. Snowden, the revelations that he put out were often based on Snowden's misunderstandings of the way NSA worked, amplified by misunderstandings of journalists about how it all worked, to give actually a very misleading uh, perspective of what NSA was capable of uh, and what it was doing. So I think that you know, history is going to need to correct some of these you know, f uh, first impressions. I, I would have to disagree what? about uh, what you're saying, because what Snowden did, he said, 
this is going on and there has been no public debate mm. about the population does not know that you have this structural data acquisition metadata mm. and they have not been informed there hasn't been a debate and 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 this is one of the significant mm. uh, things that he did I think so whether he misunderstood or not the, the point remains of how um, surveillance was working it resembled more a totalitarian uh, state to a certain extent because of the volume of what was collected even if you went to a court, the FISA court that wasn't... I'm going to have to ask what, uh, you to take this yeah. offset. Oh, yeah, we I will. Like stuff I think we will. Up. We're on. Uh, <laughs> do you have new targets in mind all the time? And if so, are you going to tell me what they are? Well, I'm not still... I don't have any targets in mind because I've, I'm not doing hacking anymore. You sure? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, not black hat hacking. Mm. Um, but the general kind of uh, wider hacktivist community is still, is still going on. There's new, there's, there's new actors, mm. but we're, st we're starting to see a lot of new activity from, from Asia and South, um, South, South America. Mm. And uh, more recently, we've had um, Phineas Fisher, a hacktivist who hacked into a whole bunch of surveillance companies to leak, to expose uh, illegal surveillance activities. So it's, there's still, it's still ongoing. It won't stop. Mustafa, thank you very much indeed. In fact, thanks to all of you who have taken part in Roundtable this week. I think we're agreed that information is becoming increasingly difficult to hide. Do we therefore have to accept that no secret can actually remain a secret? Will greater transparency bring with it a new idealised democratic ideal, as put out by some of our people today? Or does it pose a worrying threat to the very nature of democracy wherever you may find it? This has been Roundtable. From me, David Foster, and the rest of the team, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. Hope to see you next time.